If you were here in September, I'm sure you remember how smoke blanketed our region, giving us dreadful air quality that persisted for days. We worried about ourselves and our health. Many of us also noticed that birds were not coming to our backyard feeders like they normally did, and we began to worry about them. What was this terrible air quality doing to them? Looking online for answers, I eventually found a few articles that mentioned the recent work of a graduate student named Olivia Sanderfoot. That recent work was a comprehensive review of literature on the impact of air pollution on birds that she completed for her master's thesis at the University of Wisconsin at Madison in 2017. From Cindy and Elaine, I then learned that Olivia Sanderfoot had moved to Seattle, where she is currently a PhD student in the Quantitative Ecology Lab in the UW's College of the Environment. In an article from last May in Crosscut, I learned something that many of you at tonight's event already know. When the summer's wildfires scuttled the field research that Olivia had planned to conduct in Eastern Washington, she initiated a community science project. Its purpose was to investigate how COVID-19 lockdowns impacted detection and presence of birds in the Pacific Northwest, and she invited local people to join the project more than 900 people did, including Cindy and Elaine. And Olivia will share some of the findings from that project with us tonight. She's currently working on her doctoral thesis entitled, and I'm gonna read it, Fire, Smoke, and Song, Exploring the Impact of Exposure to Particle Pollution on Bird Observations and Acoustic Activity. I'm thrilled to introduce Olivia Sanderfoot. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. I'm looking forward to sharing some updates from my current research. I'm switching over to presenter mode now. So hopefully you are all able to see my screen. Could Elaine or Vicki confirm that you can see my screen now? Yes, Olivia. Awesome, great. Looks good. All right. So thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm so excited to be here. It's a total honor to be invited to give a talk at the monthly meeting of WAS. Um, I have looked forward to sharing the results of my research for some time now, and this seems like the perfect platform. I only wish that I could be here in person with you all as opposed to online. I would like to begin my talk by respectfully acknowledging that I am on the traditional land of Coast Salish peoples, including the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, who have stewarded the land where I live and work for thousands of years. I would also like to acknowledge that my research includes studies of birds and their habitats on lands that extend across the continental United States, which encompasses hundreds of unceded indigenous territories. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process of reconciliation and sustainable just management of these lands and the resources they provide. Before sharing results of my research, I wanted to provide a bit of history uh, that sets the stage for the work that I do today. Some of you might be familiar with the colloquial phrase canary in a coal mine, which is used to refer to some early warning signal of a future danger. What you might not know is that that phrase is actually based on the historical use of canaries in coal mines to serve as carbon monoxide detectors for miners. Miners would bring caged canaries down into the coal mines with them and use them essentially as carbon monoxide detectors if the birds showed any signs of respiratory distress, if they killed over, passed out, or even died, they would know that air pollution had reached dangerous levels and it was time to get out of there. Uh, interestingly, this practice actually continued as late as the 1980s in Britain when 200 canaries were still in use um, before that practice was banned in 1986. So this has actually been something that uh, has taken place for a good while now. Air pollution is not the only type of uh, pollution that birds are sensitive to. In the 1960s, Rachel Carson's award-winning book, Silent Spring, brought attention to the widespread impact of DDT and other pesticides on birds. Carson linked the indiscriminate use of pesticides to avian mortality, much to the frustration of those who stood to make a great deal of money off of these products. 
Carson warned us that technological progress is not always in line with the best interests of society and reminded us that the well-being of people is intrinsically linked to the health of the ecosystems we depend on. Her message struck a chord with hundreds of thousands of people and inspired the movement that led to the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency. So from canaries and coal mines to Silent Springs, birds have long stood as a symbol for human vulnerability to environmental change. We have known for a long time that air pollution puts public health at risk. Uh, widespread smog events in the mid 20th century sickened thousands of people and killed hundreds of individuals. The photo at left was taken in 1953 in New York City during one of the major smog events that took place in the last century. Eventually, Congress realized that we needed to do something about this. So they worked together to create and pass the Clean Air Act. And amendments to the Clean Air Act of 1970 were signed into law by President Richard Nixon. This Clean Air Act, is one of the strongest pieces of environmental legislation that we have today. And the Clean Air Act of 1970 gives the Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, the authority to regulate emissions to protect public health and safety. One of the key pieces of the regulatory framework established to mitigate air pollution uh, is the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. The National Ambient Air Quality Standards regulate concentrations of six common health damaging air pollutants. And there are two types of standards. There are primary standards to protect public health, and there are secondary standards to protect public welfare. So these secondary standards are designed to improve visibility and reduce damage to infrastructure, crops, and animals. The primary standards are more stringent than the secondary standards. Now, air quality controls are actually quite expensive. And sometimes because of that, um, we decide maybe they're not worth the investment. But study after study have shown time and time again that the benefits of air quality regulations far exceed the cost. In fact, the United States Office of Management and Budget has shown that at minimum, air quality regulations um, are basically a three to one return on investment. So that's pretty good bang for our buck. So what does the air we, look, air we breathe today look like? Well, since the Clean Air Act was passed in 1970, air quality has improved throughout much of the United States. But unfortunately, it isn't safe to breathe the air everywhere, and it isn't safe to breathe the air every day. And unfortunately, wildfire smoke and reduced enforcement of regulations in recent years pose new risks. Around the world, only 1 in 10 people breathe clean air. This means that 90% of people are regularly breathing air with levels of health damaging air pollutants that exceed the levels that the World Health Organization has deemed as safe. So this brings me to my overarching research question. How does air pollution affect wild birds, the birds that you and I know and love? Well, I would argue that we already know that air pollution must pose risks to birds because a century ago we started using canaries to monitor levels of carbon monoxide and we knew that they would make good sentinel species because birds were more sensitive to air pollution than we were so if birds are sensitive to air pollution and air pollution still pose, poses risks to us then i feel we must conclude that air pollution still poses risks to birds despite the regulations that we have in place now, why is it that birds are more sensitive than us to air pollution? Well, birds are more susceptible to air pollution than other types of animals, including mammals, because they respire more efficiently than other terrestrial vertebrates. This means that they are able to extract more oxygen per unit volume of air inhaled. They're very, very good at breathing. Uh, I think avian respiration is very cool, so I hope you will allow me to geek out for a second about this. Uh, the GIF at right compares and contrasts mammalian and avian respiration with mammalian rep respiration shown in the top panel and avian respiration shown in the bottom. Yellow indicates oxygenated air, while pink indicates deoxygenated air. So as you can see, uh, mammals and birds do not breathe in the same way. And in fact, the avian and mammalian respiratory systems are totally distinct. 
So I hope everyone can take a deep breath with me real quick. Ready? I always like building that into my talk because I sometimes forget to breathe myself. So it's a good reminder. So when we breathe in and out, in and out, that's bi-directional airflow. Our lungs expand and we inhale, our lungs contract and we exhale. But this isn't how birds breathe at all. Birds utilize a unique system of air sacs to constantly push fresh air into their lungs. They breathe in one continuous loop, and this allows them to maintain contact between oxygenated air and the gas exchange tissues of the lungs in a way that just isn't the same in the mammalian respiratory system. Furthermore, uh, birds exhibit a thin blood gas barrier and cross-current gas exchange, which means that their air capillaries and blood capillaries are positioned at right angles. And both of those features further improve the diffusion of oxygen. So I know that was a lot of information, but here are the key features to remember. Birds exhibit unidirectional airflow, a thin blood gas barrier, and cross-current gas exchange. And together, these three key features make them exceptionally good at respiring, meaning breathing. They are very good at taking up oxygen. But this unfortunately also means that they're very good at taking up other things that are in the air, other chemical compounds, other reactive gases and particles that might pose risks to their health. So we know that air pollution poses risks to birds, and we know that the air isn't clean every day, everywhere in the world. So what does that mean for the birds? Well, unfortunately, air quality to date has often been overlooked in conservation biology and resource management. And I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of my talk about why that might be. Um, and the impacts of air pollution on wild bird populations are largely unknown, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. And one of my goals as a graduate researcher at the University of Wisconsin was to figure out what we know and what we don't know and put it all together in one place uh, that could provide a foundation um, for this field of research moving forward. I published the, li the literature review that I conducted under this name and title um, in 2017 in Environmental Research Letters. Uh, and in this literature review, I synthesized studies published to date uh, since 1950, more specifically, on the impacts of air pollution on birds. This required identifying and analyzing over 100 studies buried in unrelated literature from ecology to ecotoxicology to veterinary medicine. In addition to synthesizing studies to date, um, I also outlined knowledge gaps to be addressed in future studies. And the thesis was published in an open access journal, which is really exciting because it means that that resource is available to the public. Anybody can download it for free anytime. And to date, this paper has been downloaded more than 21,000 times, which for any scientific study is a lot. So I'm really pleased that I was able to create something that so many people have found to be a useful resource. I wanna explain um, sort of how I went about selecting these papers and what we found. So in any literature review, the first step is to figure out what literature is out there. And to do that, I used a database of scientific studies, um, Web of Science, to isolate papers that I thought might be related to my research topic. I used the search terms shown here in combination with the words birds and avian. And I downloaded any paper that could possibly be related to my research topic and then gave them a read. And while reading these papers, I asked myself a series of questions. Where was this study conducted? Which species were studied? Is this a field study or a laboratory study? Are the researchers examining the effects of controlled exposure or in situ exposure, meaning in place in the field? Finally, I was able to write up the results. Uh, this literature review did confirm that relatively few studies exist on air pollution impacts on wild bird populations. Uh, if we think about um, how many searches pop up when we are using those key terms in Web of Science, 
we see that we only find about 100 papers or so when looking for studies related to air pollution or air quality in birds. And if we compare that to the, the amount of literature that's out there on air pollution and human health, it's just so much smaller, which makes sense because we care a lot about human health, as we should. Um, but I do hope that in the future we start to see a shift here um, and we think a little bit more about how air pollution could affect non-human animals. Uh, air, air pollution, exposure to air pollution is linked to negative health outcomes. While we might not have many studies out there, um, we do have, um, hang on a second, I want to subtract this little screen to the side, there we go. Um, while exposure to air pollution is clearly linked to negative health outcomes in birds, um, we still have a lot of knowledge gaps, which I'll go over in a second. But we do know that birds exhibit respiratory distress and illness, elevated stress levels, immunosuppression, behavioral changes, and impaired reproductive success when exposed to air pollution. And furthermore, habitat degradation can lead to changes in resource availability that can further impact birds. For example, if air pollution causes damage to vegetation in a forest ecosystem, that might impact the resources that are available to birds that depend on that habitat. So air pollution triggers these direct health effects in birds, such as respiratory distress and illness. And air pollution also leads to indirect effects through changes in resource availability. And together, these direct and indirect effects have been shown to lead to declines in bird abundance. There aren't that many papers out there on this topic, but there are a few that have suggested that air pollution has led to declines in population density. Some even take it a step further and say, that the declines in bird abundance ultimately lead to a reduction in overall biodiversity. And we need a lot more research on this to confirm this pathway, um, but obviously if air pollution is triggering a decline in biodiversity, um, birders and nature conservationists are, are going to want to think a little bit more critically about how our air quality regulations do or do not protect wildlife. So what do we need to look at moving forward? Well, the papers that we have are, are great, but together they offer limited inference on the impacts of wild, free-living birds and the sensitivity of responses to specific pollutants. So we have information from laboratory studies um, or controlled exposure experiments, and those are really great because they tell us about how specific concentrations of chemicals impact the health of birds. But those birds are in captivity, and they might not be exposed to the same concentrations of air pollutants that they would encounter in the wild. So that leads to limited inference. We also have information from field studies, which are awesome because we're studying birds in their natural habitat but those studies often lack an exposure estimate. So we don't necessarily know what concentrations of air pollutants a response that has been observed by researchers is linked to. Um, ultimately, we need to be thinking about how to build those response relationships. Furthermore, only a few species in a few places have been studied. Again, ultimately, what I would like to see is uh, our research our research field move forward in characterizing dose response relationships for vital rates, such as survival, growth, and reproduction. So we can really say this concentration of air pollution drives this change in a vital rate and link that to population density. I will not be able to do that in my PhD, but that is where I would ultimately love to see this research go. We are making progress, which is really exciting. Um, Web of Science searches this weekend showed that we have 50 or so new papers that pop up um, when we search for literature related to air pollution and birds or air quality in birds as compared to um, the number of results that were generated from that 2017 literature review. Um, and I'm also making progress on this research question and I'm excited to share results from some of the work that I've been doing as a graduate researcher at the University of Washington with you all this evening. The first paper is currently in review. It's titled Wildfire Smoke Affects Detection of Birds in Washington State. So I'm able to give you all a sneak peek this evening of what we're finding, um, but please don't take any screenshots of the plots that I'll show because as I said, this paper is, is still in review um, and journals like to be the ones to publish the results rather than seeing screenshots of plots show up on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, by way of background, I wanted to just provide a quick overview for how, um, of how wildfires impact wildlife. So 
Wildfires do generate high quality habitat for many wildlife species, including birds. For example, the blackback woodpecker depends on um, ecosystems that have been affected by wildfires. Wildfires also pose direct threats to animals, though, including mortality, injury, and health effects from exposure to high ambient temperatures and smoke. Um, and during wildfires, we think a lot about that, but we don't necessarily think so much, um, until recently at least, about how smoke could affect birds or other wildlife that are thousands of miles away from the site of a wildfire. We do know that wildfire smoke poses risks to public health. Um, incidents at hospitals increase following exposure to wildfire smoke. There is a wealth of epidemiological literature out there that suggests that exposure to fine particulate matter, which is one of the primary components of smoke, um, poses risks to human health. So it's interesting to me that we know a lot about how smoke affects us as people, but a lot less about how smoke affects non-human animals. Again, there just isn't that much research out there on the impacts of exposure to wildfire smoke in non-human animals. So I want to quickly go over the hypothesis for this study because I think it's an, it's an interesting approach um, and I hope I can get you to buy into it. So wildfire smoke may trigger behavioral changes in birds and these behavioral changes could signal underlying health issues, could signal some uh, health effect that a bird is experiencing due to exposure to smoke. Or behavioral changes could be in response to some of these other environmental changes that co-occur with smoke. For example, when it's smokier outside, we see cooler temperatures and reduced visibility, and birds might respond to those changes in their local environment. Either way, whether these behavioral changes are triggered by underlying health conditions or in response to changes in the local environment, we would expect that those shifts in how a bird behaves would influence their overall presence or detection. So a bird's presence is simply whether or not it is there. Detection is a little bit trickier. Uh, we all know that just because we're going out looking for a bird doesn't mean we're going to be lucky enough to find it, even if it's there. And so when we see a bird, that's great. We know it's there, but just because we didn't see a bird doesn't mean it's not there. Um, and I think behavioral changes that birds exhibit during these wildfire smoke events could influence their presence, their detection, or both. And that in turn would influence their overall probability of being observed. Now, detection during a smoke event could also change if people's ability to observe birds is at all affected by smoke. For example, smoke does impair visibility. So it's possible that our ability to detect birds could change during a wildfire smoke event simply because we're not able to see as far. Fine particulate matter, as I mentioned earlier, is a component of smoke. This refers to suspended particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter, so smaller than the width of a human hair. Um, these particles are very fine. They can become deeply embedded in the respiratory system, so they're very dangerous for human health. And my hypothesis for this study was that fine particulate matter as a marker of smoke pollution would be correlated with the probability of observing birds. I expected to find that there was a relationship between this marker of smoke pollution and the probability of observing birds. More specifically, my research question was, hang on, my slides are frozen, there we go. How did fine particulate matter during the wildfire season, which I defined as July through September, affect the probability of observing birds in the state of Washington from 2015 through 2018. For this project, I relied on data collected in 39,284 checklists submitted to eBird, which is a global semi-structured citizen science program, which I'm sure many birders on this call have used. If you were birding in Washington state between 2015 and 2018 in the summer, chances are I used your data for this project. I also uh, relied on air quality data collected by monitors run by the Environmental Protection Agency. The 71 air quality monitors I pulled data from are shown as black triangles in the map at right. Those gray dots on the map represent all of the eBird checklists that you and other birders uh, contributed to this project, whether you knew it or not. 
I also relied on data, uh, weather data from the North American Regional Reanalysis and data on land cover from the National Land Cover Database. So we've got data on bird observations, air quality, weather, and habitat. I'm going to dive into the stats real quick, but I promise for anyone who's not super excited about math, it'll be quick. I chose to analyze the 50 species most commonly observed in July through September of 2015. I wanted to look at a great number of species because I expected to find that species responded differently to smoke events, but I also wanted to make sure that we had sufficient detections of birds that I could fit my models. I used generalized linear mixed models with a binomial distribution to model the probability of observing each of the study species during the 2015 through 2018 wildfire seasons. My models include did a number of different effects. I included fixed effects of year to account for annual variation in the populations of birds that we see here in Washington state. I included a fixed effect of land cover class to account for differences in habitat. I included day and day squared as effects to account for seasonality, which we know influences the presence and detection of birds. I also included the effect of duration, survey duration, because um, a good birder knows that the longer you're out observing, the more likely it is that you will observe a species. And I also included effects of temperature, precipitation, and fine particulate matter, because I was interested in thinking about how weather and air quality influence the probability of observing birds. I also included a random effect of observer in my models, which accounts for differences in ability and skill level among eBirders. So here's the exciting part, my results, which hopefully will pop up now. There we go. Particle pollution influenced the probability of observing 30% of the study species included in this analysis. At right, you can see a plot of the predicted probability of observing birds as a function of the daily mean concentration of fine particulate matter. So as fine particulate matter increases, we assume that smoke pollution is also increasing. And according to our models, the probability of observing these 11 species decreased as smoke pollution increased. Those species were the great blue heron, Canada goose, osprey, bush tit, red-tailed hawk, bald eagle, double-crested cormorant, California gull, Caspian tern, Heerman's gull, and house run. But intriguingly, we also found that four species exhibited this positive response. So they were actually more likely to be observed as smoke pollution increased. These species included the cedar waxwing, red-breasted nuthatch, western sandpiper, and yellow-rumped warbler. Now, why might this be? I expected that most species would exhibit this negative relationship. And here we're seeing a positive relationship. But I don't think there's any reason to assume that we as birders would be better at birding the smokier it gets. We're not going to feel well, we're not going to be able to see as far. That doesn't make any sense. So there must be something going on with the birds that's making them easier to see during this time. I believe that our results suggest that birds exhibit interspecific behavioral responses to wildfire smoke. So species are changing their behavior in a way that makes them more or less likely to be detected by us birders during these wildfire smoke events. Now, unfortunately, this analysis cannot tell us why that might be. What are the mechanisms behind this change? I have ideas. I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A. Um, but what I'm really excited about is what our next steps will look like to dig into this further. I am currently working on an extensive bioacoustic survey with my team at the UW Quantitative Ecology Lab. And our goal is to collect acoustics data during the wildfire seasons um, out in Eastern Washington in order to learn more about what is happening on the ground and how birds might be changing their behavior as it gets smokier. Research to date has suggested that both mammalian and avian vocalization may decline during smoke pollution episodes. There is a study of a haze event um, in Singapore that found that as smoke pollution increased, acoustic indices that are representative of avian activity declined for four months following that smoke pollution episode. So this is not like a, a small short-term response. They found long-term shifts in avian vocalization patterns that they linked to this smoke pollution episode. 
I believe that we can use acoustic data to learn more about changes in avian activity that are triggered by particle pollution or smoke during these wildfire smoke events. If wildfire smoke causes a decline in avian vocalization, that would lead to a decrease in some of these acoustic indices that are used to characterize soundscapes or the acoustic environment. And so if we go out and collect bioacoustics data, we can use that data to calculate indices that tell us something about avian activity and avian vocalization more specifically. And that's really exciting because then we have evidence of the mechanisms behind why our probability of observing birds might change during a smoke pollution episode. The research question that we've posed for this project is, is there a relationship between smoke pollution during the wildfire season and acoustic indices? We are collecting bioacoustics data in two study areas in Eastern Washington, shown in the map at left. This data is being collected as part of the Washington Predator Prey Project. We've re deployed recorders at sampling locations in the summers of 2019 and 2020. So yes, we, we do have some data on this intense wildfire year. And the bioacoustics recorders were designed to capture the dawn chorus. Uh, in addition to data on bioacoustics, on avian vocalization, we need data on air quality. And we are very lucky to be working with folks on the AirPACT, the Air Indicator Report for Public Awareness and Community Tracking Team over at Washington State University. Uh, AirPACT is a regional air quality model run by the Laboratory for Atmospheric Research. And by pairing the data that they provide on fine particulate matter during the summer, and the data that we have on bioacoustics, hopefully we're able to learn more about how smoke pollution drives changes in vocalization patterns. I'll also need to account for changes in weather and habitat across our monitoring sites that could also influence avian activity. Uh, I plan to use linear mixed models in this project to assess the relationship between smoke and acoustic indices. And these models will include fixed effects of land cover class, day, day squared, temperature, precipitation, and smoke. Again, we have to account for differences in habitat. We have to account for differences in seasonality. We have to consider the fact that weather can also trigger changes in avian activity. But what I'm really interested in is how does smoke layer on top of all of that? What is smoke doing to avian activity? Um, to account for inherent differences between sites, I will also include a random effect of site in these models. I expect to find that smoke pollution had a negative effect on acoustic indices, but I could be surprised and I'll have to come back and let you all know what we find out when we finally get a chance to analyze this data. Um, I also hope to provide proof of concept that pre-existing bioacoustics data sets can be leveraged to assess how ecological communities respond to air pollution episodes. Next, I want to talk about this amazing community science project that so many of you kindly volunteered with this past spring. Uh, this project is set up to look at a number of different characteristics of the urban environment, including air pollution. Um, and of course, I am most excited about thinking about how air pollution impacts birds, but we're going to learn so much from this project. So just ahead of time, in case I forget to say it later, Thank you so much to all of my volunteers for helping us out with this. We could not have done it without you. As a reminder, in case you had forgotten, we are currently dealing with a pandemic which led to worldwide lockdowns last spring. In fact, half of the global population, 50% of all of the people on planet Earth were under some type of lockdown in early April. And these lockdowns led to a rapid shift in human behavior. And those rapid shifts in human behavior have had both predictable and unanticipated impacts on wildlife. Um, those uh, impacts are being studied by ecologists all over the world right now, and I'm really excited to be part of an international team of researchers who are collaborating on some of these projects. For example, roadway traffic is known to contribute to bird vehicle collisions, air pollution, and noise pollution. And so we would think that during these lockdowns, as roadway traffic declines, air pollution and noise pollution would also decline. And this could have positive impacts on birds that may be negatively impacted by air pollution and noise pollution. However, a decline in roadway traffic could also lead to the increased movement and activity of introduced mammals, such as rats and cats, 
which actually have a negative impact on birds. So there could be good things that happen for birds during the lockdown, and there could be bad things that happen to birds during the lockdown. We're not quite sure where things are going to fall yet. Uh, the hypothesis driving this community science project is simply that these different changes in human activity will have an impact on the characteristics of urban bird habitat. And as the urban habitat changes, we will see a shift in the presence and detection of birds. And the data that we've collected in this project will help us figure out what characteristics of urban habitat are related to the presence and detection of common backyard bird species. Uh, we're going to ask and answer three very exciting questions with the data that our volunteers collected. What characteristics of urban habitat affected detection and presence of birds this spring? Were these variables different during COVID-19 lockdowns? And then what does that suggest about how COVID-19 lockdowns affected birds? We already know a little bit about how air pollution, noise pollution changed during the lockdowns. And so if I am able to show that those variables are important for the presence and detection of backyard bird species here in the Pacific Northwest, that could tell us a lot about how human activity affects birds. For this project, I launched a data collection blitz with the help of my team through eBird to monitor birds across the Pacific Northwest last spring. Our data collection blitz launched on April 1st and concluded on June 30th of this year. And we asked all of our volunteers to conduct weekly stationary 10 minute point counts. And I will admit that I was blown away by the support for this project. I thought I might get 25 or 30 people, most of whom I knew and who I begged to participate to help out. And I was really, really excited to see so much interest. We had over 900 people sign up for this project. Over 880 people are still on our mailing list. And I was able to track down contributions in the eBird data set for over, from over 400 unique observers. Our final data set includes 7,216 eBird checklists at 479 sites from 404 observers. And as an ecologist, this just makes me so excited because it is very rare that we get to work with a data set of that many repeat counts at that many hundreds of sites. A single person could not do that. A team could not do that. A lab could not do that. But you all made that happen. So thank you so much for that. In addition, a subset of our volunteers participated in an online survey to collect more information about their monitoring sites, such as whether or not a bird bath or a bird feeder was present. And I was able to pull in data on land cover, weather, air quality, and human mobility from publicly available data sets. I will be focused on analyzing the presence and detection of bird species most commonly observed by our volunteers. Again, just because we want to have enough data to fit our models. And I'll be using a special kind of model called an occupancy model for this analysis. These models are really cool because they allow us to tease out the observation and state processes. They allow us to think about whether or not a bird is present and then whether or not it is observed. We can use these models to evaluate how habitat and other variables influence the presence and detection of a species. And they allow us to count for imperfect detection. Again, that idea that even if we're out doing our darndest to find a bird that we really want to see, we might not see it. Our detection is not perfect, and our models need to account for that. In addition, I will be sure to account for the impact of land use and canopy cover on species presence, as well as the influence of seasonality on detection and the effects of temperature and precipitation on detection. I um, hope you're picking up on a pattern here. All of my models account for habitat because habitat is essential in determining where birds are and whether or not we see them. All of my models include uh, day and of year and day of year squared to think about how, um, how avian activity changes during the year. And all of my models, I assume that weather is also important in addition to air quality in determining whatever response variable I'm analyzing. What's really exciting about this project is that in addition to looking at those standard covariates, I'll also get to look at a set of non-standard covariates. Um, in particular, I will be testing whether or not supplementary feeding, um, hummingbird seed and suet feeders influenced bird presence uh, during the COVID-19 lockdowns, as well as whether or not the availability of bird baths influenced the presence and detection of backyard birds. 
I will also be thinking about whether or not human mobility or air pollution influence our detection of birds. If I as think about the different impacts of air pollution on birds and I start thinking about the behavioral changes that we might expect to see, I would think that as air pollution increases, the detection of birds might shift, just like we saw in that first study I uh, went over. So in this project, I will be thinking about whether or not exposure to fine particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide, which is a gaseous air pollutant and a marker of emissions for motor vehicles, influenced the detection of birds. So I don't have that many results to share yet, but I'm excited to share um, some information on what we've learned so far from this data set. Most volunteers did choose to monitor birds in their own backyard, so we have a lot of data from backyards all over the Pacific Northwest. Most of those monitoring sites were located in developed areas, which isn't surprising because we specifically targeted folks who lived in urban and suburban areas. Percent canopy cover across these sites ranged from 0% to 91% with a median value of 21%, which suggests that we actually have um, a wide range of developed urban habitat um, represented in our monitoring sites. And that's very exciting because that means that we can account for how even small differences in habitat might be affecting birds. Point counts conducted um, also varied in weather conditions. So folks were out birding rain or shine, which is great because that means that we really can account for weather and then think about how air pollution and supplementary feeding and bird baths layer in on top of that. These are all photos from some of our volunteers who so kindly shared them with me so that I could um, share them with our community scientists and our newsletters, which I just had a phenomenal time working on this spring. Air quality last spring was excellent in the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is really good for us and really good for birds and other wildlife, but maybe not so good for me because it could be difficult to tease out the effect of air pollution. Um, so far, I have conducted one test between the total number of species observed and uh, air pollution. I found no correlation. So that suggests that if we think about the total number of birds that one of our community scientists may have seen during their 10 minute weekly point count, that total was not dictated by exposure to fine particulate matter or nitrogen dioxide. Um, that doesn't mean that air pollution wasn't affecting birds. It just means that in those 10 minutes, the total number of birds that our birders saw was not influenced by air pollution. I'm not the only one working on these super exciting research questions. There are also researchers around the world who are starting to think more about how urban and industrial air pollution could influence birds. And I'm really totally jazzed about this new study that came out from Cornell um, right before Thanksgiving. I'm sure many of you have already seen it um, all over tweeters. Um, there was a recent study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, this study, linked ozone pollution to declines in bird abundance. They went so far as to demonstrate that air pollution regulations may have saved billions of birds. That is the correct number, billions. So that is a very exciting and big step in this research topic to show that um, air pollution regulations have saved that many birds as is groundbreaking and it really takes this to a new level and I'm excited to be uh, working on a few projects that will hopefully extend what we know about that and think about the mechanisms and which species might be most sensitive to air pollution and why. I provided the citation below for those of you who would like to read it. Um, there are also some really great articles published in local newspapers about this as well. This shows us that policy really matters. The same air quality policies that keep us safe, keep birds safe too. But I think it's really important to remember that the right to breathe clean air is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed in this country. And it's not guaranteed in the rest of the world. And we have to keep fighting for it. Um, I was very privileged to provide expert testimony on, a, um, on the effects, the possible effects of a clean fuel standard on birds at the invitation of Audubon Washington a couple of years ago. And I'm always available to answer questions about how um, different policies might impact air pollution and therefore birds. Um, because I think if we think about air quality regulation from the lens of both public health and ecosystem health, we can come up with truly excellent policies that protect birds and people. And that would make the world a much better place.
And while policies matter, and they do matter, um, there are still things that we as individuals can do to reduce air pollution and protect the feathered friends that we love. Our decisions matter. So here are some things to think about moving forward about how you could um, change your day-to-day -day life just a little bit to reduce air pollution and help out our feathered friends. We can all do our best to conserve energy. We can limit the time we spend driving. We can walk, bike, use public transportation or carpool whenever possible. We wanna take good care of our motorized vehicles and equipment so they run efficiently and smoothly. We should eat local whenever we can. We have delicious food here in Washington. We might as well enjoy it. Uh, we can reduce waste, especially plastic waste. We can mulch or compost yard waste. We can create green spaces. And most importantly, we can vote. Our voice matters. We wanna get our voices heard. Um, we want elected leaders who believe in evidence-based decision-making, who are going to look at studies like the one that just came out in PNAS and think this matters. I want to do something about it. With that, I would like to acknowledge that I am supported by the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program and the McIntyre Stennis Cooperative Research Program, and thank the UW Quantitative Ecology Lab, the UW Conservation Ecology Lab, all of our volunteers and bird enthusiasts everywhere that contribute to community science, including eBird and the Breeding Bird Survey and the Christmas Bird Count, all of that matters. All of your data is used to answer research questions that would not be answerable without your support. And I'd also like to thank my friends and family. With that, I will take any questions.